Good morning or good afternoon, depending on your location. Uh, welcome to uh, Wiesman's online training for today. Uh, you are uh, basically, uh, our, your host today actually are myself, uh, Scott Bootlayer, and uh, from Waterloo, Ontario, the fabulous Mark Norris. Can you hear me, Mark? So, um, just a little uh, today before you get going, because yep. I should right. have this before you started, obviously. No uh, problem. If you guys got questions, uh, Put them in the questions and answer box you'll find on the toolbar. Uh, if you put them in the chat, we don't get to record the answers very well. It's a little bit more difficult to do that and hand them out to you guys later. Uh, so you, you want to answer, ask a question, answer it in, or ask it in the questions and answer, and I will try to keep up with Scott in real time on those questions. Uh, if I need to hold on to one to the end for Scott so he can answer something that, that he's more familiar with than I am, we'll do that. Um, and at the very end, you'll get an email at the end of the, at the you know, whenever they send it out tomorrow or the next day, whenever it is, uh, which will have all the Q and A's. It'll have um, a PDF present of this presentation. And I think you're going to try and get a handout of, of something Scott too. So that'll be the handout. We'll go with it. Yes. Um, and then this is obviously being recorded. So at some point in the next few days, uh, it might take me a week. Um, it'll be on our YouTube channel uh, as, as this name of this webinar, right? Um, if you know somebody that couldn't make it today and wanted to do this, we're going to do this all over again next week. So I'm going to make you know Scott get up to the microphone again next week, and okay. uh, and do it all over. And I think that's that's all I have. Um, so I'm going to turn it back to you and let you uh, you carry on. I'm glad you're there. That's uh, like I say. That's so we're all we're all tuned in here. And uh, well, let's just get started on this. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to start off a little bit of a re review here about you know what solar is and how uh, Vsman approaches that here, uh, particularly in North America. Uh, and uh, we're really going to kind of focus in on uh, you know there's you know some of the challenges that you we deal with uh, as far as solar thermal, and uh, that's going to expose the difference between the FM. A series of collectors, which is are the Therm Protect collectors uh, Wiesman offer to North America here. And uh, the idea is that uh, we'll, we're going to explain those differences and uh, how these will make a uh, basically a safer system uh, for as far as operation. And also probably uh, on the cost side, uh, because there are less components that you have to deal with uh, with FM panels uh, in your solar thermal uh, how that can uh, basically reduce the costs, uh, simplify your installations, and of course make those a bit more competitive, uh, which in turn would mean more green lights on those solar projects. So instead of uh, putting a lot of work in there with not a lot of results, um, obviously it's a budget world that we live in here. Uh, if we get those budgets down, that, that goes a long ways to having more success as far as, uh, as, as, far as those installations. So let's have a little uh, peek in here first. Uh, as far as what we have available uh, to us as far as a fuel here. So as far as solar thermal, obviously we got a beautiful picture here of the sun in the, uh, in the German countryside here. And we're talking about solar thermal uh, uh, today. Uh, so there are different types of uh, solar thermal applications you can think about. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, power plants that are that are solar thermal, so they uh, basically uh, can turn a, a turbine and, and create electricity. You've got solar thermal in a PV type of, of application where we heat up that, uh, that collector. Of course, that uh, gets the molecules moving and creating uh, DC electricity on a, on a PV panel. Uh, what we're dealing with here, uh, is basically, as far as that energy that we're hitting, you see some quantitative uh, information, that little blurb uh, to the left of the uh, picture of the sun there. But this is not to scale, obviously, what you see here in front of the screen. Otherwise, you wouldn't even see the Earth as far as the if it was to scale here, you know, in relationship to the size of the, the sun here. But it gives you some pretty good information. Um, the surface of the sun, you get about 63 megawatts per square meter. Uh, as that moves, about 150 milli million kilometers between the uh, sun and the earth here, uh, a lot of that energy is being used up uh, as it travels, bouncing you know, um, around. But what hits the earth's atmosphere is about 1360, about 2% of that energy is hitting the actual atmosphere. And then from there, it's going to be reduced. We're going to have a look at that as we, as we go through here. What's actually available to us as far as, as energy here, if you think about a gallon of oil or a cubic foot of gas, I mean, that gives us some quantitative 
uh, idea. We know if, you know, a cubic foot of gas, natural gas is about, you know, a thousand uh, BTUs per cubic feet. Uh, thereabouts. So we have those kind of uh, measurements. Uh, it's important to obviously know what we're getting uh, out of the sun here as well when we start to do this application. So just a quick look there uh, as far as uh, what we're dealing with as energy. So we're taking that uh, solar thermal, so that uh, radiation, insulation, whatever uh, you want to call it, and uh, we are going to transfer that to heat some liquid. Uh, so that radiant hits the collector, uh, it's going to heat it up. We've got some fluid moving around in those collectors. It absorbs that energy and it basically will travel uh, to whatever type of load that we're looking to heat up here. And we're targeting in North America, at least in our uh, applications here, low temperature liquid heating. So these aren't steam plants, et cetera, for producing electricity. We're trying to use that uh, energy to heat uh, loads that are under 100 degrees Celsius. So below the boiling point of water and atmosphere is what we're targeting as far as a, an application for solar thermal here in North America. And how we achieve that is using glaze collectors. So these are the collectors you see on the left-hand side. Uh, Wiesman offers uh, these uh, Vitosol 200FM uh, collectors in two uh, configurations. So you've got the horizontal, so that's the long flat uh, collector you see there. The piping connections are on the ends. Uh, and then, of course, you have the vertical collectors, uh, the tall uh, ones standing up behind it there. And, of course, the connections are on the left and right-hand side of those collectors as well. So there's two different orientations. And we're going to kind of go through a little bit of that to, at the end as to what, uh, you know, why we do that and what, you know, it's all about fit as far as your application goes. Uh, there are also unglazed collectors. Uh, and uh, those, you know, are typically in North America, at least, if you look at uh, a lot of seasonal pool heating, we're going to kind of get to that in a little bit. Uh, that would be a, a lot of those little rubber mat type of, of collectors you see on, you know, people's uh, garden sheds and stuff like that. And they've, they've hooked it up to their, their pool to heat the pool up there. Uh, you know, sometimes in the, during windstorm, those might end up in the neighbor's backyard or something like that if they weren't tied down or fixed correctly. That's when solar power meets wind power uh, type of thing. But uh, those are, you know, unglazed collectors, a little bit different application. Glazing means essentially we have a glass on the collectors here uh, and that helps and, and some insulation obviously as well. So it's a bit of a, more of a box than exposed. Uh, and that adds some efficiency when we get down into lower temperatures. So, you know, unglazed versus glazed, basically glazed are meant for more of a year round type of operation where unglazed collectors, depending on your location, obviously, uh, we're more Northern up here. So, you know, it would be more of a seasonal thing for us not to use those unglazed collectors in specific applications. And what we're going to use these glaze collectors for uh, as far as loads. We looked at the top here. We looked at low temperature applications for our solar thermal. Uh, pool heating. I just talked about seasonal pool heating with unglazed collectors. You can also heat your pool with glaze collectors. Very similar type of, of, of method. Uh, we can also use it for domestic hot water. So these are kind of the low hanging fruits as far as solar uh, applications go. Uh, everybody needs domestic hot water in their buildings, you know, residences that you don't have to have a hydronic heating system, but you probably have a domestic hot water tank or some sort of method of heating that water up, uh, whether that's by fossil fuel or by, uh, by renewables, but certainly uh, solar can be applied to domestic hot water heating, even though you don't have a, a hydronic heating system in your building. Uh, space heating as well is another application. So anything that you know requires heating that building, as long as the temperatures are we're looking for a low temp, uh, then that uh, is an a, a availability as well. Uh, and process heating. So something I just kind of added in there. So it might not necessarily be a domestic hot water heating load, but you can see you know some applications where you've got factories, etc. You know commercial uh, run. Um, uh, applications where you may need a, you know a, a bunch of hot water to, to clean equipment or or some sort of function like that uh, and this uh, solar can help to preheat or, or actually uh, you know give us a deliver temperature for that particular load so there's a, you know there's a lot of applications for the solar thermal it's just about having a look at what those might be and we'll uh, kind of get an idea here uh, based on your 
uh, area. So how much solar is going to be available for those different loads is kind of shown in this little graph here of, of North America. And you can see the red spots there, you know, more southerly climates. You've got lots of, of kilowatt hours per square meter per day or BTUs per square foot per day on average hitting that uh, the surface of the earth at those particular uh, areas. As we go a little bit farther north, so you know, I'm up in this little corner of the world. You can kind of see we got a little bit of yellow tinge here. Uh, so we're kind of in that two to three kilowatt hours per square meter per day, you know, or BTUs. Uh, reality is there's something called a solar constant. So I mentioned, you know, there's that, that 1300 uh, plus uh, kilowatts that uh, hits the Earth's atmosphere. As that uh, radiation hits, goes through the atmosphere, it balances off of cloud cover, uh, in the case of today here on the West Coast, we got some smoke that came up from the fires. And of course that, uh, you know, direct sunlight, you can see the sun is kind of a reddish tinge there today in the sky. Uh, that radiation is now is, is going through smoke particulates. And of course, a much cooler day than it would be normally uh, because that sun is not as intense because it's being blocked by that, uh, or that smoke. But uh, the constantly, as far as what gets through the atmosphere, we call it uh, on a clear sunny day, you'd be dealing with about 317 BTUs so per, per square foot. Uh, the solar constant basically is based on the intensity of the, the radiation coming from the sun. And uh, it's a constant, but sometimes there are dips in that, uh, in that uh, amount of intensity. So it, it is constant there, uh, but uh, kind of interesting that it does kind of has a, has a little bit of a fluctuation as far as, as operation. But this gives you a good idea about, you know, where you are, wherever you might be sitting and, you know, taking in this, a uh, bit of training, you know, just the amount of radiation that's hit in the earth surface in your particular area. And regardless of if you're in red or if you're in blue here, there are going to be applications that are going to be really good fits for solar. Uh, the intensity there uh, will change based on the, you know, time of year that we're dealing with here. So a very, you know, kind of uh, northerly climate type of, you know, north of the uh, 49th parallel type of graph here showing, uh, you know, the intensity changing as far as the amount of radiation the, the Earth's surface, you know, in the summer months, logically, we got more sun, more direct uh, sunlight. Uh, we're going to have an increase in that radiation at the Earth's surface. When we get to the winter time here, you know, the colder seasons, obviously, the daylight hours are, are lower. The sun is a different angle to the horizon. So, it you know, a little bit of dissipation in the radiation. So, less of that solar radiation available for us to trap there. So, obviously, we're going to make hay when the sun shines. We're really targeting these 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 months where we got a lot of intensity uh, which can really offset some of these uh, times a year we don't have a lot of, of radiation at the earth's surface and we have to look at it also on direct versus diffuse radiation so direct radiation if we look at it would be you know a clear sunny day and we just talked about in a clear sunny day when it's you know 20 25 degrees C out there you know in the you know 70s to you know 80 degree Fahrenheit uh, when that sun uh, hits the surface, we're dealing with about 1,000 uh, watts per square meter, 317 BTUs per square foot. That's that constant I just mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, if you're, you know, a, a, you know, a cloudier day, then that drops down, you know, you're getting about 60% uh, of that uh, radiation hitting the, uh, hitting the surface now. Uh, some of it's bouncing off the clouds and going back into the um, atmosphere and they have a really cloudy day or really smoky day you know that's going to start to drop down significantly here as well uh, so there's the kind of the idea about you know you look outside your window there and you see a nice clear sunny day you can think to yourself that's 317 BTUs per square foot you know or you know if it's a really overcast day you're going to look outside that window and it's going to be uh, you know slightly diminished just as far as the amount of radiation hitting the, the surface of the earth and if we had one collector what does that mean as far as the production down here on the bottom you can see uh, some ideas about the output of your collector so just like a boiler has a rating on the side of it there you know 100,000 B2s 125,000 B2s per hour uh, it's kind of neat that you can actually look at the amount of intensity we have here and you think of it like a modulating boiler uh, where you know the load uh, basically the output of this collector is changing based on the amount of energy we actually are hitting the glass here. So like a low fire boiler, when we got a very small amount of gas, we're gonna have a low uh, input. 
we 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 uh, hit the gas and, and put that in the combustion area all of a sudden now we're at full output and your collector is basically at high fire at this particular picture position so the reality is here if you had a, you know one collector up on the roof and a full you know sun you could basically clock that at about 6,500 BTUs per hour of energy that it's going to be grabbing. Uh, and that energy now can be used for, again, a multitude of those little applications that we just looked at. So just a bit of a, some information on how this, uh, how this works, how we harvest it, and some of those, uh, you know, moving goalposts that we have to deal with as far as Mother Nature and what type of, uh, you know, weather we have in that particular area. Uh, and utilizing that that energy, so as far as how we we gather it uh, in solar for these types of applications of low temperature, uh, for you down in the sun belts down in the uh, in the south there, uh, you would have what we call low, warm climate. Uh, type of applications where you'd use like open loop type of systems where just open to atmosphere and you're circulating your potable water directly through the collectors and as you need the heat uh, the uh, the water flows through the collectors and heats it up uh, directly uh, or you would have like a thermosiphon system those would be uh, those types of collectors where the tank sits above the collector uh, outside and just using the uh, you know physics there that as the, the water heats it, it's more or buoyant it moves up to the top of the tank the colder water moves back down the collectors reheats and now you've got your storage available when you open up your faucet that you can grab that energy at any time these are obviously uh, we're not worrying about the risks of frost or freezing up uh, so those are, are good applications for those types of or, or good types of systems for those types of climates seasonal systems I talked about kind of like those rubber mats for your uh, for your pool heating here in the northern climates you're not going to leave those outside you know when the frost hits you're going to basically take those down and store them back in the garage um, if you have a you know open loop and thermosiphon system here in the more northern climates those would be seasonal as well you'd, you'd want to probably just you know decommission those uh, when the when you get some frost warnings and then basically in the springtime when the when there's no risk of frost you can turn those systems back on and get your uh, operation so you know cottages and those types of things might be good applications for those types of, of loads for more automatic types of systems where we don't really have to worry about you know uh, do we have to commission the system recommission it those types of areas uh, in the northern climates we want to uh, basically look after that risk of freezing uh, and it comes down to you know variations of two basic types of systems uh, that we utilize here uh, in the uh, areas where there's more risk of frost we call them uh, closed loop types of systems and for the plumbers out there listening in, uh, you'd understand a closed loop, obviously like hydronic systems that we uh, pipe uh, into homes on a daily basis. Uh, we use closed loop type of applications to, uh, to, um, to uh, install those systems. And also drain back types of systems uh, we will utilize here in the more colder climate. So for pool heating, domestic hot water heating, that process heating and space heating that we would you know, we utilize, these are the two main areas that we would focus in on. And when we are looking at uh, the two types of systems, so just a quick review here as to what uh, these systems might look like if you're walking into them. Uh, here's a picture of a drain back system. Not all the components are here. You don't see the sensors, their locations in the tanks and the collectors. You don't see the control. Uh, you don't see some valves and stuff of like that that would be part of a typical hydronic system that you would, you would see in most uh, buildings. But what you do see here are the main components. And you've got your, obviously your collector at the top here. You've got your piping. You've got a holding tank. And you've got, of course, your circulator, uh, heat exchanger, and of course, your storage of the energy that the collectors are, are gathering here. And uh, with drain back, essentially how this uh, system works is if the collector picks up a temperature that's higher than what we're holding in the tank here currently, this pump uh, will have enough uh, head capacity that it's going to literally recharge the collector with the fluid sitting in the little holding tank here. So when this pump comes on, it literally turns this tank into a piece of common piping uh, so that we create a circulation here. And now we're gonna start to pull the energy off of that collector and we're gonna dump it into our heat exchanger which is gonna heat this tank up. Once this uh, tank gets up to temperature, uh, what happens is the pump here stops 
and all of the fluid will now drain back into the conditioned space so we don't have anything exposed up here uh, that will freeze and cause some sort of failure here. Uh, so I've basically had a look at what these, you know, what the types of, uh, what we're looking at here for a system. Uh, your heat transfer fluid is typically going to be water in these systems. That's the, the advantage of the drain back is it can just be water. Uh, but if the piping is not done carefully enough here, I have seen systems locally that were drain back, uh, but they've had to utilize uh, a glycol or antifreeze in that system because the piping, there were spots there where the uh, fluid would kind of congregate, it didn't drain back properly, and of course there was risk of frost or freezing up in those areas. So they've changed to antifreeze. Uh, still the same kind of concept though. Uh, antifreeze just basically sits down in the holding tanks when there's no pump on. So the frost protection here is gravity uh, or some combination of gravity and some antifreeze in, in those cases. Overheat protection is also gravity, which means in overheat, we're gonna get to this stagnation type of uh, terminology here in a little bit, what all that stuff means. But effectively, if there's no fluid in the collectors, we don't have to worry about overheating uh, the system. So basically everything sits down here. It's not exposed to that energy that the collectors are gathering right now. Uh, and that's going to uh, basically mean we don't have to worry about overheating the fluid in these, in these uh, systems. Other uh, uh, open atmosphere, typically, you know, you need to vacuum relief valves, et cetera, on these systems. Uh, no expansion tanks, relief valves are required. Uh, obviously, the piping I just talked about has to be pretty uh, careful. Oh, sorry, I'll back that up a little bit. Uh, and also uh, special control typically to make sure that, you know, this collector is still gathering energy here, but all of a sudden the tank temperature drops where we can turn this pump back on. We have to be very careful that if we push this fluid now into that hot collector, we can start getting some steam hammering because now that's going to hit that hot surface and we're going to flash that to steam. When water flashes the steam, it expands 1500 times. It makes a bit of a racket. If you ever heard it, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, we want to avoid that from occurring that can damage components, et cetera. So you're going to have some limitation there, uh, especially on atmosphere that we don't uh, hit that collector when it gets up to high temperature or we could do some damage to the system. So usually once the collectors get up to temperature here, this pump has to stay off uh, until we get a drop in temperature uh, so we can restart that system. Uh, on the other hand here, we've got the closed loop system. Uh, and uh, this is the type of system that Wiesman uh, uses or applies here in North America. Our collectors are made uh, in a specific way that they don't work in a drain back system. They're not, uh, the piping inside is like a meandering a serpentine type of, of um, configuration uh, as far as the piping inside the collectors. And it's difficult to drain those out. So as far as drain back, uh, we, uh, we don't do drain back with the 200 FM collectors. They're going to be, uh, they will be a closed loop type of a system here. And we use an antifreeze, a glycol. We're going to look at those here in a little bit. Uh, the system piping and circulators are going to be much smaller because we don't have to worry about that drain back issue. Of course, the pump here is working on a closed loop system. So what we're looking for here obviously is uh, the resistance in the piping here uh, and uh, size in the pump accordingly. Uh, very small flow rates in our systems, you know, typically about 0 0.4, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.4 gallons per collector here is kind of the range we're looking at. So very low flow rates. Uh, uh, so that means the pipe sizing here can be quite a bit smaller. Uh, not really a lot of concern about sloping and et cetera on the piping here. It's more about getting it as direct as possible from the collectors into our heat exchanger. The more piping, obviously, the, and the bigger the piping, the greater the heat losses are going to be. We want to avoid that. So as direct piping as we can get uh, with some limitations there, we'll we'll kind of talk about, I keep hitting the clicker there. Sorry about that. Uh, however, local codes may require the heat exchanger here be a double wall style with, uh, with some sort of atmospheric uh, leak detection uh, means. Uh, it depends on your authorities to have in jurisdiction. Uh, here in Canada, we have a couple of codes uh, that are, are part of uh, the solar thermal, so the heat exchanger codes, uh, hydronic heating code. And basically what it comes down to will be pressure on the solar thermal versus the potable side. Uh, so if the pressure is greater on the, on the uh, 
solar thermal side uh, versus the domestic hot water side of your system, uh, then there would be a double wall requirement there. Uh, also, if uh, depending on the type of glycol, we like to use a food grade type of glycol. Uh, so as far as toxicity levels go, there's a big concern there. Uh, we use a glycol basically that is uh, has a uh, relative, essentially a relatively harmless type of, of uh, of um, designation. So uh, as far as the operation, you have to check with your uh, authorities having jurisdiction locally as to what they would, would require as far as that particular heat exchanger when you're using a closed loop system. Uh, I know a lot of uh, areas are accepting single wall as far as uh, their system uh, appliance here, but always good to check uh, versus uh, find out uh, after the fact. So our application, so now we know how we gather it, the different types of systems and which, which system Wiesman uses. The, the best applications are on the right-hand side as far as you know those ideal ones. Uh, if they can domestic hot water, we need domestic hot water fairly consistently throughout the year. Uh, if we have a pool, that's a great application. You gotta heat that pool up. If it's indoor or outdoor pool, uh, we can use solar for that. Apartment buildings, multifamily homes, lots of domestic hot water, and the domestic hot water multifamily homes tends to be, uh, uh, to a larger degree, uh, more spread out. You know, using you know, some people use it in the evening, some during the day, uh, so it has a really good profile as far as the usage. Uh, lots of demand. Uh, hotels, very similar to multifamily nursing homes, obviously. So you see, you get the idea here. Is there's lots of um, applications here that we are using uh, domestic hot water. Uh, for, uh, for, for requirements or heating pools. Uh, on the left-hand side, you kind of see the best uh, applications uh, where we are talking about the usage. So seven days per week is obviously a great uh, usage. Every day is fairly consistent. That uh, usage throughout the, throughout the, the year uh, would be advantageous as well. So very uh, making sure that we use the 12 months a year we're using that particular load. Uh, I threw in recirculation loops here as well. Recirculate uh, loops in your system. So whether you're using a hydronic system uh, or you're, you've got a, a direct fire tank or something there that's heating your domestic and you got a recirc loop, uh, these are constant users of energy. Uh, and typically you're gonna have that, that pump operating uh, you know, during the day, et cetera, uh, when you wanna use the hot water. And of course, as that's recirculating, it's dropping the temperature down. Uh, and if you have solar, of course, now we can start to use that uh, as a, um, to reheat that or recharge those tanks to get that temperature back up again. So the research loops in your domestic systems have become something very popular uh, just because the houses are now getting much larger. And of course, those fixtures are much farther away from the mechanical room. And we want to use that uh, for our, um, you know, for, to our advantage. Uh, so that would help basically offset the fossil fuel coming on there during the day to heat that tank up for what we're dealing with there. Uh, some lower uh, grade type of applications here, uh, you know, intermittent erratic loads where, you know, you turn it on every so often, you need that hot water. Uh, those are ones that, uh, you know, regardless of the type of, of solar you've got, uh, your fractions, your amount of energy you're gathering are usually fairly low. Uh, if you're not using the the solar in the summertime, that offers some challenges as well. Uh, we've come up with some applications there for schools and stuff that are quite effective, but a school is notorious for that where you, you close the doors in June and you'd open them back up in September. And there's lots of solar there that we could use uh, that were, that's not available to us. Uh, but uh, like I say, regardless of the type of system you've got, if you're not grabbing that, that energy and using it in those peak months, then your efficiencies are obviously going to drop and there's a challenge there as, as far as operation. Uh, think about office buildings, you know, no use in the weekends here and some office buildings now they're, you know, people are working home now remotely. There might be some real intermittent uh, uses there now as far as, as solar, but same kind of idea there. Uh, it's when uh, these systems here all have one thing in common when we look at them, uh, most susceptible to issues with overheating and re will require some sort of protection. And this is kind of where the FM panels, uh, as you hopefully will see here, uh, will shine uh, when we've got some of these challenges that we have to deal with in our, in our applications. And basically it's the idea that the, the thing they have in common here is there is potential for that solar pump to stop 
uh, when there is lots of solar energy of still available. So lots of energy still hitting the uh, collector uh, surface, we're still gathering it, but that pump is off and we're not moving that uh, energy anywhere. It kind of stuck in the collector. So that's those types of applications. Uh, and let's have a look here at what I'm talking about, uh, just so you get a good idea. Uh, this is a picture that we've used for years. It's in our solar design guideline uh, that we've got available. Uh, a shout out to Steve Royce and uh, our, our uh, solar department in uh, our head office in Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, the solar design, the design guideline, uh, I'm going to uh, attach a copy uh, to the um, a presentation when it goes out to you. Uh, it's just full of useful information and he basically built that pretty much from the ground up there. So an excellent, uh, he'll, his name will actually pop up a couple times as I move through here. He's kind of done a lot of work on some of the stuff that you guys actually read or fill out uh, when we're doing solar projects. So shout out to Steve there. Uh, a lot of the stuff is, uh, this presentation, a lot of these pictures stuff are, are uh, from him. So uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, this picture here is showing you two different systems right off the bat. So you've got a two collector system and you see the profile of that two collector system in this little line right here. And they kind of follow each other a little bit. You can kind of see the peaks and the valleys are very similar. Uh, and then on top here, uh, we've got a six collector system and it looks like this as far as the amount of energy. The blue line down here is going to, or the blue area is your domestic hot water heat requirements. And we've got a uh, space heating requirement for a a, a small house or low energy requirement house, uh, or we got a, a, a larger house here or one that's basically not as well insulated. Uh, and you see the low profile for that as well. So you see in these buildings, the domestic hot water profile is pretty similar and it's pretty consistent throughout the year. Sometimes you get a little bit dip in the, you know, in the hotter months here when you're taking a little cooler showers just because the temperature outside, you get those heat waves and stuff like that for a couple weeks, it might drop here, dip or whatever, but it's fairly consistent. Your domestic hot water low requirements. Your, the orange here, the dark orange and the lighter orange here are depicting the space heating requirements for these buildings. And you can see that you've got some large peaks here on the, on the seasons where we're in winter. And then as we get closer to the, you know, the, the late spring and the summer and then early fall, you see how those loads drop off. And you'll see here, the solar almost works in reverse and it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? We have basically, you know, the amount of, of, of energy hitting the uh, collector surface here is at its lowest point in these winter months and it starts to gradually climb up and then we hit the summer peak. So as we're trying to heat our building, we are basically our radiation levels or intensity is very low and we're not really getting a lot of that energy that we need to heat the building. So this is all, anything basically outside of the graph here is all fossil fuel. Anything inside of our graph here in the, in the six collector system, we are actually uh, using the solar to heat these particular buildings. You see the two collector system, you just catch a little bit of the, uh, the late, uh, late spring, early summer type of requirements here. Uh, but the key thing to look at here is this point, this area right in the middle where you've got no load now uh, in your system for space heating, but your collectors are still gathering that energy. Now, what are we going to do with this particular area here? This is where that solar pump is going to be off, but we are still collecting energy on those collectors. And this is kind of the theme of this little uh, presentation is what happens at this little point in time. Uh, so let's have a look at it. Uh, we've got our collector sitting here. This is just a domestic hot water system. You've got a temperature in the tanks here of about 130 Fahrenheit, about 55 C. Uh, the set point is 140 or about 60 C. And I use the 75 C here as a baseline, but typically in operation here, if we're at this temperature, we're probably, like I say, we're pretty close to achieving this set point. If the temperature of the tank was down in the 30s, then this collector temperature would actually be quite a bit lower as well. It's just based on as we, as we pull that heat in, uh, as the temperature rises in the tanks, so will the average collector temperature as we move through here. So we're at about 75 C here, about 167 degree Fahrenheit at this particular point. And this is where uh, I wanna introduce this whole Therm Protect and kind of what we're talking about as far as a collector and when it says uh, Therm Protect. It, Therm Protect is the coating, the absorber coating that we use in our 200 FM collectors. 
And what it does, uh, basically, as the temperature in the collector starts to rise, it's going to get to a certain point, and that point's about 75 C, or about 170 degree Fahrenheit, where the absorber coating is going to start increasing its emittance of energy. So it's going to stop absorbing, or not stop absorbing, it's going to absorb, but it's going to emit more of that energy, or release it from the collectors, uh, so it doesn't overheat or slow down the process of overheating. So it goes from about 7%. Uh, basically, on average, once you hit about 75C, it starts to rise from 7%, and it'll eventually go all the way up to about 40% uh, emissivity. So you can see the difference here uh, is we uh, basically pumped uh, water uh, through the collectors here, got them up to temperature, put on a thermographic image here, and you can see the energy being released off the thermprotect, where a standard absorber coating, uh, you see that the it's not emitting uh, to a much lower degree. So its emissivity is staying at about 7%, where as we start to reject heat, we're emitting a larger amount of that energy. So effectively getting into a balance here. And the advantage of that is, is going to be hopefully displayed in the, uh, the following slides as we move through here. So we're at 75 degrees C at 167 uh, point here. We've set our temperature. So our pumps have now stopped in our system. But we are still in a, you know, a nice sunny day here. The sun's out there, nice and happy, still hitting the collectors, uh, but our pump is off. So no more energy is being transferred. Everything is basically sitting inside of the collectors. And we would call this the first phase of stagnation. So we're going to review that here in a minute, but just kind of keep this in your mind. What's happening right now? Well, the temperature in the collectors will start to rise. As we're still gathering energy, the sensor will feed that back. The difference between our collector and our competitor collector is going to be the fact that we are going to reach that temperature at a slower rate. So it's going to be much slower. We're going to start to emit more of that energy rather than, than, get, than hold it in the collector. It's going to let it allow it to, to uh, radiate out. So at 100 degrees C, I just want to point out this time difference is critical uh, in your solar thermal applications as far as the time here. Uh, the reason why I mention that, if we had a system uh, and if we look at what we don't see here, so I'm going to kind of fill in a few of the blanks here, you would have a sensor ideally in these collectors sitting up right in this area, picking up that hot temperature that these collectors are sitting at. By uh, uh, on the opposite side of it, the sensor we're reading in the storage tank, we're not going to be reading a sensor up here. That's not a good uh, position for a sensor in a domestic hot wire tank that's being controlled for solar. We don't even want it in the halfway point. The lower that sensor is measuring, the more chance if somebody opens up a fixture uh, or if the tank starts to cool down, it's going to cool down at the bottom here first. We're going to introduce cold water in here. Uh, and if this sensor picks up that change in temperature, that's all we need with this temperature here to restart this pump again. So this time uh, difference here is critical uh, as we start moving through our system here. And that can oftentimes make the difference between this system basically getting out of the first phase of that stagnation and going back to normal operation or moving into the second stage. So as we move through here, again, the pumps are still off and the collectors are rising up in temperature. And again, we're at about 293 degree Fahrenheit now with those pumps off on both collectors. And again, looking at that time difference now, it's because the, em the emittance of radiation is actually increasing as the collectors heat up here, you can see that that time is even longer as far as the difference the, from getting from one point to, the, uh, to our collector getting to that same uh, set point. Again, more time for the system to correct itself uh, without getting into a situation where we have to stop this from pump from coming out physically because the collectors are getting uh, too high as far as its uh, level of temperature and we don't want to damage the components. And then the uh, as we start moving through here, uh, you'll notice that our graph here flattens out at about 145 degrees C. 
uh, versus the competitor here, it's going to continue rising because uh, we're now at a balance here with the with the 200 FM collectors, where as it's gathering energy, it basically just radiates it out, so it emits it. So we get into an equilibrium here as far as the energy. Uh, we maintain about 145, where uh, standard collector is going to continue to rise up to its maximum level as far as operation. And that's when we start getting into that second phase of stagnation. And just to kind of review this, what the stagnation means or overheating, sometimes it's called steam back. Uh, there are five phases uh, as a closed loop uh, solar thermal uh, installation uh, and or application type of provider here. Uh, we've studied this. Uh, people much smarter than me have studied this and it's well documented uh, and understood. And we actually can have safe operation of our system, even if we have this type of event happening in our, in our operation. Oftentimes, if you have a solar thermal system in your home, it's probably gone into some sort of stagnation. Maybe you went on holidays, Maybe the pump failed one day, maybe a sensor went bad, maybe you had a power outage, nothing worked, and the system went, you know, you didn't think about it, you went out shopping that day, and your collectors are sitting in this up there in the roof, and, and uh, all of a sudden they hit the stagnation, and all this stuff was happening, all these five phases, you get home and, you know, dump your groceries in the, in the, in the fridge, and uh, basically you have no idea anything that has happened. The next day, power's back on or whatever, and uh, life is great and things operate normally. And that's the idea behind uh, this type of, of, of uh, understanding is that it can be safe in operation provided uh, we don't uh, you know, try to do something that would cause something uh, adverse to happen. So phase one uh, of stagnation is when that pump turns off. And basically when the pump turns off, but we're still having energy hitting the collector here, what will happen is the temperature is going to rise. And when temperature rises in a closed loop system, we also get a pressure rise. So our pressure is going to rise here. And eventually we're going to get to a point uh, where we move into phase two. And depending on the type of collector here, it says here after about 10 minutes, so this would be a standard type of collector, not with an FM uh, panel, uh, you're going to reach a boiling point where the temperature in the collector exceeds the vapor pressure point, and now you're going to get a flashing to steam. And depending on how the system is piped here, uh, all of the fluid would evacuate from the, from the collector at that point. Or, or if you've got a bit of a trap here like we show here, what will happen is some fluid would get, would get caught in here, and you'll get into uh, a different phase of, of uh, evaporation here. But in phase two, we get the boiling point. So now we're boiling uh, the fluid in the collector. Uh, it expands 1,500 times, and it starts to push the fluid out of the collector. And our expansion tank here now starts to uh, charge up with that fluid. So the, collect, uh, the fluid moves into our expansion tank at this point, And again, our pressure is rising. So we'll now flip from phase two here down to phase three. So again, after about 30 minutes uh, in, a, in a standard type of collector without ThermProtect, uh, you are now uh, basically uh, boiling off the fluid here if it's stuck in the collector uh, until it particularly goes dry. And you can notice the temperatures now. A big difference is uh, the Wiesman FM collector sits at about that 145C. We will not get up to these temperatures. We get the superheating of the collectors here at this particular point level. Uh, so what's going to happen is we're going to boil the collector, we're going to boil the fluid uh, in phase three. We hit phase four, and that's essentially where we get into a balance point, where the temperature of the collectors and the pressure in the system gets to a point we can't boil it anymore fluid, we just sit there with that temperature and pressure at this particular point, just kind of an equilibrium. Uh, and that's going to happen. This superheating phase four is going to stay in this phase until the temperature in the collectors drops. And that's when a cloud hits the, uh, hits the sun there or we start getting into uh, basically uh, the, um, the sun moving and uh, basically losing a bit of that intensity. And as the temperature drops in the collectors, of course, uh, the fluid starts to condense, it moves back into the collector, and effectively, uh, nothing happens. We didn't lose any fluid. Uh, it basically sat in the expansion tank, the temperature dropped, and it moved back into your system. Uh, literally the next day, that uh, if the sun comes back up again, uh, the system is going to go back into operation. So that's the idea behind uh, a properly um, installed and basically um, engineered uh, 
closed loop system here. Uh, the expansion tank here is obviously critical to make sure that we have enough volume in that tank uh, to accept all this fluid volume. So one collector, 20 collectors, we have to make sure that expansion tank is the right size when we have this type of operation. So what happens to our system when we get into these stagnation areas? This is kind of critical when we're looking at the FM as well as far as comparison. Uh, first thing is to look at the fluid. That's the stuff that's boiling in the collectors when we hit this steam back or, or stagnation. Uh, Visman in North America, we sell the Typhicor HTL. It's a, it's a glycol. It's a uh, non-toxic, basically on the hot Sterner scale. It's in the relatively harmless uh, area. And uh, its temperature stability is up to 338 degrees Fahrenheit, but 107 degrees C. So as far as the ingredients, the components, the mixture here, as long as we don't reach these temperatures, then we're going to have uh, basically the characteristics, the makeup of this glycol is not going to change. Uh, some other glycols and, and the ethylenes we have over here from uh, some, some of our other um, antifreezes that we've used in the past. Uh, we like to stay away from the ethylene glycols uh, and methanol and all that kind of stuff because of their toxicity levels and, of course, heat exchange requirements, etc. We tend to kind of move into the propylene glycols, etc. For solar thermal applications, they're, they're, they're just fine as far as their operation. Uh, you can see the Dow Frost uh, uh, is 121 degrees C, about 250 Fahrenheit. It's stable up to. And then uh, the HD, uh, uh, more additives in it, and it's good up to about 325 degrees Fahrenheit, 163 degrees uh, C it's stable uh, to. Now, what's the importance of that? If you were to take a standard glycol, a plumber's antifreeze, whatever, and throw it into a system and it heated up a number of times, it would eventually look like that little bowl or little petri dish that you see down here. You know, you got some, you know, the signs of the original, you know, forms of life in that, uh, in that, uh, that little dish down here of a se severely degraded uh, glycol that you'd see here. So if we exceed those temperatures that we're looking at, it's going to start to really degrade the, the glycol or the fluid that we're using as a heat transfer. Uh, when you use proper type of glycols for solar, so they'd be usually designated as a solar type of, of fluid, uh, their additives and inhibitors have been added in there to keep the pH level at a higher, uh, typically your pH levels are you know, nine plus uh, with, a, uh, with a proper solar um, inhibited glycol. Uh, but now they can handle much higher temperatures uh, for short periods of time, depending on what you're looking at here. Uh, you know, if it goes to steam, for instance, short periods of time of operation, um, or we end up having some of that chemical change as we look at down here again. So even these glycols, if we exceed these temperatures that we see here, we can get this formation, even if it was made specifically for solar applications. So we can see here the next advantage uh, that we are dealing with. So if we look at the vapor pressure of Typhocor, so the HTL that we just looked at, the stuff that we sell here at Wiesman. If we have 15 pounds at the collector, so if you had a little pressure gauge stuck in the collector and it was reading 15 PSI here, once the fluid in the collector reaches about 108 degrees C, or basically that's one bar, which is about 14.7 uh, PSI, atmospheric pressure. So one, um, one bar, 15 PSI, I rounded it up a little bit. Uh, 108 degrees C is when we would start to have uh, the fluid there start to flash. If we go up to 130, uh, basically up to uh, two bars, up to about 30 pounds of pressure at the collector here, now that boiling point moves from 108 up to 130 degrees. If we go to 145 C, which is the max temperature of the ThermProtect collector will reach in, a, in an application, 145. Uh, we are basically at about 44 pounds. Uh, then once we exceed 44 pounds, we're going to stop. Uh, we're going to start uh, that fluid starting to boil or flash the steam. So if we keep the pressure basically above uh, 44 pounds in our collector here, then because the collector temperature can't exceed 145, we cannot boil the fluid in here. It's going to stay in fluid form. Uh, it's not going to boil off, which again protects the glycol from those uh, dangerous levels of operation. In a standard collector, uh, if we go above this little orange line here, so about six bar, 
we are going to open up our relief valve. There are about 87 pounds, about six bar on our, our little divicons here, which is a typical kind of solar thermal uh, relief setting. Uh, so at about 190 Fahrenheit, we, are, we looked at our C that we had in our collect, competitor's collector, we are well above that, we're at about 10 bar. So we would have to maintain the pressure at about 148 pounds in order to make sure we didn't boil 190 degrees C water. It's a little bit ridiculous there, but that's kind of what we're, we're dealing with. A big difference here between our 145 maximum temperature and maintaining 45 PSI, very reasonable, capable of doing, uh, versus this temperature and pressure up here to get that uh, collector in a balance where you can't boil the fluid. And that usually ends up with this type of decision. So as soon as that relief valve opens, we lose fluid. Now the pressure is going to drop when everything gets back to equilibrium there. Uh, this is going to be a service call. So somebody's going to have to go out there, recharge that system. And usually that means you're going to see the tarps up on the roof and all kinds of, of fun stuff like that. Uh, so as far as your operation, when we're talking about you know, safe operation of systems, uh, when we have frequent uh, potential for overheating here, we would want to add a heat rejection uh, system to these uh, collectors that, that are basically can drive to very high temperatures. Uh, so those would be basically your, your domestic hot water uh, spacing systems uh, where you have no summer load. Uh, Steve and I joke a lot of times there basically when we see uh, uh, requests for space heating uh, simulations for solar thermal applications, we always recommend maybe you should add a pool in there to add some summer load there to help us uh, you know, get rid of that heat. Uh, but that's, you know, basically the balance there is that if we size for domestic hot water spacing, so we're going to oversize that system uh, in the winter time to, to give us some space heating uh, in the domestic, uh, but in the summertime, we don't have enough domestic hot water load to, to utilize all that. So that's where the heat rejection would come into play here. Uh, evacuated tube systems, uh, their temperatures can get really out of hand and depending on the type of systems we've experienced here, uh, if you have some flow issues uh, in evacuated tube systems, they're just punishing. So you've really got to engineer those systems correctly. Uh, and uh, again, most of the time you're going to want to, because they can superheat so, so quickly, the temperature's there because there is literally uh, no emissivity, very minimal in an evacuated tube because of the vacuum uh, impact on the, uh, um, as far as Insula, uh, the insulation side of their uh, heat rejection is, is often recommended in, in, in even a domestic system. Oh, sorry. Uh, you know, obviously systems where we have long off periods, schools, ski chalets, uh, intermittent loads, uh, oversized systems that would kind of carry into the domestic hot water spacing applications here. Uh, but whenever you see, as we had that first graph or we saw that, you know, there was no load in that big red flashing area there uh, on that graph uh, earlier, whenever you see that, it's always a recommendation for these systems that we would add some sort of heat rejection to dissipate that heat. So our system comparison here now, uh, to maintain these temperatures, you know, we got 45 pounds in the collector here now, uh, 145 uh, C is our maximum. We're not going to boil in this system. With our competitors here, we would want to turn that pump on and start rejecting the heat to make sure that we can maintain and keep those collectors in a safe operation as far as its, its usage. So the difference here basically between the two would be obviously more cost and in installation, uh, more controllability here on this side, probably a couple more sensors, more programming, where the system over here uh, looks uh, you know, very different, a lot less components, less expense, a little easier as far as its operation. And the bonus here as well is, uh, you know, oversizing is much less of a problem with this. So you can start to add on, grab more solar fraction, uh, which might be, uh, you know, uh, another uh, another solar seminar as we move through here about, you know, proper, you know, installations, et cetera. Uh, but for today, just trying to talk about this, uh, this coating that we're using, but basically a much safer system without a lot of added components in the, as far as the FM and the, and the ThermProtect. So in steam back or, or overheating, uh, stagnation is not a problem. If we size that expansion tank correctly, so even in an FM system, uh, if that, you know, you had something happen here, where we dropped in pressure, you might get that thing flashing to steam or the pressure's down low, but it's not an issue as long as we have the expansion tank size correctly, that the glycol is basically uh, going to uh, keep its basic characteristics and, and chemical makeup uh, if it comes back, as long as we keep that temperature down below its maximum temperature. 
Uh, high temperature components are used, so you want to make sure everything in that system is made for solar, uh, expansion tanks, uh, um, pumps, uh, uh, sensors, uh, all the things that we add in there to make sure it works. And if we keep the collector at 45 pounds, uh, no steam formation, uh, again, just an extending of the components in this particular system as far as operation. So a huge advantage, and we're looking at these uh, systems as far as comparison. So just a little bit of a review here as far as what we're dealing with, just so you, just a reminder, uh, that's the, 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 the key components here we're talking about as far as advantage is the time that it takes the FM collectors to reach those, those temperatures where we're gonna have to shut the system down. Uh, and also the fact that we can, we can arrange this system with temperatures and pressures, we can't even boil the fluid sitting in there. So some large advantages there, when we start dealing with systems uh, and how we pipe them and how we use them. Just safer and uh, just easier installation. So just a little review here as we move through the different types of, of um, components that Wiesman will make for their system. So these are slope roof kits. You can see from two to, you know, to multiples of collectors here. Uh, Wiesman can supply you with the roof mounting kits here. Uh, all of the fittings to join these collectors together and pipe them to make this nice seamless look. Uh, to your systems on the roof here. These are, that's all uh, Wiesman equipment. Basically we size it uh, for you uh, as you move through here. So this is what it looks like. We have freestanding racks, so roof mounting. Uh, we also use these in ground mounts as well. Uh, some applications you're gonna see here, we use these in combination where you can actually mount these on the walls, but all this racking here uh, is part of the Wiesman components that we would sell. Uh, same here on the horizontal collector, you see how it's mounted versus the vertical in this application. Uh, we've got uh, large arrays. You can see this one here is in a, uh, looks like it's in a school. Uh, this is actually our headquarters and world headquarters in Allendorf. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, you can see how nice and clean the stacks are here. That's, it's part of their morning workout routine. They climb the stacks here and, and, and wash those stacks. They look nice and clean. Uh, but that's, you know, kind of the idea here. Uh, if you'd ever uh, had, uh, had a look or did some research on our facility here in Allendorf, uh, I believe that they have already hit the climate target set, which are very aggressive in, in, in Germany as far as the use of, uh, you know, the offsetting of fossil fuels with renewals. Uh, we have already met those targets here in our head office. So the combination of solar, uh, as well as uh, biomass, uh, heat pumps, uh, a lot of the energy required to maintain the temperatures in these buildings and the different process loads, uh, heating of uh, hot water, et cetera, are actually utilized uh, with this. So we kind of basically, we don't just kind of talk the talk, we walk the walk uh, when it comes to utilizing some of these technologies. So we have some pretty firsthand experience with it. Some other unique types of installations as well you might see. So here are the collectors sitting flat vertically on a, uh, on a um, side of a building here. So a large amount of, in a multi-unit building here, it's a lot of domestic hot water. We wouldn't do this uh, horizontally. That's about the only configuration you, do, you want to avoid with flat plate collectors. You can't just sit them flat on the ground or off flat on a roof uh, because uh, of course cleaning them would be one thing that's problematic, uh, but also the collectors need to ventilate. So you know, they need to have some airflow moving through them. Uh, and uh, so we need to have them in a, in a proper configuration. Uh, horizontal collectors, we can actually do this little uh, type of application. You see what we're doing here is using them as awnings. Uh, so in the summertime, we're reducing the cooling load of the building. So there's a benefit. Uh, and using that amount of energy now, we're gathering it in the collectors and using it for domestic hot water, whatever that particular building needs for, uh, for that thermal load. Uh, and in the winter time, the uh, you know the sun go lowers its angle, and you're still getting that solar gain to to uh, you know to allow to, to assist in heating the building as well. So some unique ways to uh, utilize the collectors for some really offsetting of you know um, some different loads, cooling loads as well as heating loads here. And then of course, if you don't want to penetrate through the roof, you can also just use the wall mount type of application and mount them onto the walls here. So a couple of different things that we got. We also supply uh, a large portion of the, assist, the requirements you have here, things like expansion tanks we looked at, uh, solar tanks that we have available here. So we have both single coil as well as two coil tanks. Uh, so that you can use one tank for um, your domestic hot water loads. Solar heats the bottom coil, the fossil fuel heats the top of that, uh, that system. Uh, again, and maybe a different day, different uh, training for that, and we'll look at it. Uh, the glycol, uh, we've got uh, obviously the collectors, we've got controls. 
and the different pumping stations that have all the different things like check valves and thermometers and pressure gauge and stuff. Uh, if we combine the solar controls, which have programs in them uh, and control strategies there to help offset or slow down that collector overheating on top of the ThermProtect, it even uh, adds that much more to that particular system. So we can really use some of the different strategies that we have in these controls to slow that rate of heat uh, that uh, is, is, um, is getting into the collectors and essentially really keep these systems in, in real low temperature uh, operation. So just more stuff that we can use uh, basically to, to make that system uh, even operate more efficiently and better. Uh, so some of the things that you might want to look at, just as a quick review here, and we're just about out of time. We're pretty much out of time now. But, you know, what are your expectations as far as your customers? What are they looking at? And this can be all over the board, you know. Uh, and they might assume that, you know, a collector or two is, you know, would be enough to heat their whole pool, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Just need to throw those two collectors out there, no problem. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's about those expectations and then meeting those expectations. Uh, you know, by ensuring that, uh, you know, what they're, you know, what they want can actually be achievable. And part of that is the budget. And we never actually get this information as far as and we're doing size here but it's always good you know it's always good you see those HDTV things when they're going to look at a house and it's like you know what's your budget today and they give them a number you're, you're rarely ever going to get that out of a, a out at, right at the outset of the system they want to see you know what you're going to offer before they say what they can afford but always a good idea if you could get some idea you know are they expecting you know a, a you know a five hundred dollar uh, price for those 10 collectors are they are they you know looking at it uh, you know it's going to cost you know 20 25,000 so it get an idea of their range of what we can what we can do uh, what's the size what's the availability you know how many tanks can we put back in the mechanical room there for storage you know how many how much roof space do you got you know are you sitting north south are we only dealing with a north facing roof you know some of those challenges that we want to look at you need to know that stuff ahead of time uh, you know, the loads that we're dealing with, how much domestic hot water you need, uh, you know, what's the size of the pool, you know, if the space heating, what's your, what's your uh, design, supply temperatures for your heating system. Um, you know, sometimes it's about CO2 offsetting. Uh, in, uh, in Canada here, we have a lot of carbon tax uh, that's, that's come out, uh, basically. Uh, so if you can offset your carbon emissions, uh, it's going to reduce the amount of tax that you're going to have to pay. So the solar is directly related to offsetting your carbon emissions uh, from your buildings. And Steve has come up with, so here's a shout out to Steve again, has come out with a, an excellent little solar checklist that we'll send out to you. So this is how VSCMIC can help you kind of grab those uh, solar projects uh, by basically giving you the information, what you can expect and what you can expect to pay for it and all that stuff. Matter of fact, we Steve's even added a little bit of a thing here. This is what you can expect to pay as far as components for, you know, a two collector system, a three collector system, et cetera, to give you some baselines right here about, you know, what, you, what, the, what those systems are going to cost right off the bat. But if you fill this out, this gives us all the information we're looking for. So, you know, roof space, angles, uh, what your domestic hot water loads are here. If you're heating a pool, what we're doing here. Uh, if you've got a pool cover or not. Space heating, you know, what types of design temperatures we're looking at and how effective that's going to be to heat your system. This is stuff we would need to know to make that uh, operate for you. Uh, designing solar, as I will say from the outset, is very different from just sizing a domestic hot water system to, to work with some boilers. There is a lot more to consider there uh, that we're going to deal with. So we just can't look at your first hour load uh, for that building and design a solar thermal system. We need a lot more information to going to do that. If you want to have a look at some engineering information, uh, we have the solar design guideline. This goes again back to Steve. Thanks very much. This is a, an excellent document. It's under 100 pages long. And most of it are graphs and pictures, you know, and information like that. Very little actual reading you're going to have to do here, but a lot of quick sizing information, everything from expansion tank sizing to line sizing to pump sizing, uh, all that stuff. How many collectors are going to need for this system, et cetera. Some real base uh, line information available here for you. And I'm going to attach this to uh, the presentation when we send it out. Uh, so you'll have this information uh, at your at your fingertips um, and when uh, Mark sends or when we send this information out to you in a PDF form. So lots of stuff in here to kind of uh, rouse through. So if you're an engineer and you're kind of you're a designer and you're you're looking at look designing systems and information, this is a a must-have document to to assist you in in that information. And there's our collectors, as I mentioned. So we're dealing with a horizontal as well as a vertical style of collector. 
uh, and uh, along with all the components there that we can uh, that we can um, basically put together a system and it's just about reaching out uh, with that information we talked about and uh, hopefully uh, in the future like I say understanding what I just kind of went over here and its importance as far as solar, solar thermal applications and some of the challenges we have uh, as far as the uh, operation of these systems along going uh, the FM system is going to make for a much uh, uh, more operatable system, a, uh, a lower cost system going in, and of course, a, um, a system that's gonna operate at a much longer uh, life cycle because without a lot of repairs and uh, et cetera, with glycols and stuff being damaged. So that's all I got uh, today. I uh, hope that was uh, informative uh, for you guys. And like I say, it was um, a pleasure to put that on here for you today, just so you guys get a little bit of information on how this uh, this FM uh, collector is different from uh, other collectors that you might see out there and what they can offer you. So if you have any questions, uh, we'll certainly look at those uh, now. I'm not sure, Mark, if we've got anything that we... We had a couple of questions. Um, I'm going gonna, gonna to steal your screen here. Sure, man. Uh, I'm going to do it down here. Hang on a sec. It's going to be second here. Uh, this one. So one of the questions was, how do you size your DHW load? Um, and and you know, Scott's given you the the um, the application and that and that spreadsheet that Steve produced, uh, which will help yes. you size the collectors for your load. But to calculate your load, we also have a tool online, the DHW sizing tool. Um, this is if you go into the either the Canada or U.S. website under the Pro Toolbox, it'll be listed in there. And down here, you see you have three different methods to calculate. Normally, we would stay in the ASHRAE method here, which gives us the ability to just pick and choose. And you pick the application, and we say residential home. And you kind of just pick what do you have for, for loads, right? So you calculate how many fixtures you have in the house. I'm just going to click a bunch here. Uh, and then when you get down the bottom here, it will tell you what your hourly system demand is, how many gallons per hour you need for hot water. Uh, and down here, it will also calculate or allow you to allow put in for your peak hours. So uh, most residential homes have a peak in the morning when everybody gets up and has a shower or whatever in the evening when they're doing laundry and dishes. Uh, and you can kind of guess at that, I guess at those numbers uh, based on the, the way the people live in the home. And then you had a choice of tanks here. Now these are based on the single coil tanks because this application is specifically for, uh, not specifically for solar, but you can see you have a calculation of how many BTUs you need. So now that number there can go into your calculation of how many collectors you need. Uh, when you click on report, it'll give you a little bit more detail of all these things. Uh, so this is a good met tool to use in conjunction with the solar project checklist to help you uh, size how much DHW the, that facility is going to need. And we have, again, all different applications here for schools and hospitals and gymnasiums and then private homes. Uh, so this is uh, something that you can, you can use uh, right online. Thanks, Mark. That's an excellent little, th a little uh, I think we should add that as a link uh, maybe too, so people can, can get there really quickly uh, to kind of add that into. Now, when we do the solar, uh, you know, there's going to be, uh, when you fill that out, but if you go to that design guideline, it'll give you some information there about, we kind of look at not the first hour in solar, but, you know, how many gallons uh, per day per person are you going to use and you kind of when I say that the people are like you know well, how do I know that I don't have any idea that well lucky for you again people much more smarter than we are have already come up with those numbers as far as some averages there which are really good kind of jumping off point so if you talk to Steve or myself uh, in Canada here uh, as far as you know what you're looking for for solar uh, a lot of the solar uh, software that we use will already have a number there that we can input so and we already have some information on you know how many liters per day per person or gallons per day per person on average people will use based on a, a single family dwelling or a multiple uh, you know family dwelling a hotel etc so there's all kinds of that information already out there uh, so we don't have that direct information. It's basically, if you tell us how many people are in that building, you know, or how many units are in that apartment, and if they're two or three bedroom or single or studio apartments, we can come up with a pretty 
good number there uh, to basically to base that information off of. So like, again, it's a, the first hour information is probably not going to be uh, really helpful to us. But if we look at it on a, on a whole day, that's really where solar comes into play when we start designing. And we've already kind of got those numbers, you know, you know, you're going to use, you know, in a single family dwelling, for instance, using 40 to 60 liters per person per day at a certain temperature, whether it's 120, you know, 140 degrees, uh, a lot of that stuff will come from the solar design uh, checklist when you fill that out and set it into us. So, uh, but I think this on top of it gives you a real good picture as far as what that domestic hot water load is for your building. So I, like I say, I, I really uh, I like the fact that we've, that uh, Mark added this into this presentation because it makes a lot of sense when we're talking about these specific loads that we have something available for you that you can look at that uh, information. So yeah, we'll throw that as a leak too. I think Mark would be a good idea. The other question I had was on uh, heat loss on the collector was, is the collector uh, insulated? And uh, yeah, it is insulated uh, collector. You bet. Um, um, there will be some heat loss on it. And as you get colder and colder, it's gonna be a little bit more heat loss. That's just natural physics. Um, but sometimes um, that actually can help you. Um, if you have a system that's slightly oversized, um, you know, you have the ability to actually use that heat loss backwards. Um, and there is an option inside the control called the collector cooling. And you can actually, in right. nighttime when the sun's down, you can actually you know, run that pump to dump heat out of the collector so that you don't superheat the tank. Uh, that happens you know, on occasion when, like Scott says, you're away for a period of time and you got no load uh, and, or you know, there's, there's nobody home or whatever the scenario is. And then now your, your tank is going to get really hot or supercharged. And then we can pull it back down by dumping the collector into the night sky, I guess. Absolutely. So those are those strategies I was kind of talking about. If you have a, a solar control and you got the FM collectors, you can, you, know, you can really start to, uh, you know, make that system where those temperatures stay in some very low, you know, for, for solar, some very low temperatures, even when we don't have a load that's actually attached to those, uh, to that system. We can basically make that, uh, make that system uh, function as a real good team there to keep that in a, in a nice, safe operational uh, kind of format but yeah absolutely there's a uh, the collectors if you think about your house your house has got insulation on the on the walls uh, basically the same with the collectors the the back wall is uh, is got some insulation on the back and also around the sides the frame also has insulation the only un uninsulated space is obviously where the absorber plate uh, and the and the glass are basically exposed to the uh, to the uh, to the radiation good thanks scott all right Oh, you, no problem at all. So I guess we're going to be doing this again next week. So if uh, if you've uh, had somebody that uh, that uh, wanted to join but couldn't, we're going to do this all over again next week. Uh, if you caught only a portion of it and you said, hey, that sounds like Scott was talking about something interesting today, uh, then you can also, you know, join us again next week. Same, I think it's uh, Wednesday again next week, so seven days from today. Uh, and if you missed yesterday, uh, Mark had a um, – uh, we did a, a uh, presentation on uh, the effects of multi-zoning on your on your uh, boilers and your system. Uh, are excellent. Uh, we had lots of conversation at the end of that. A lot of questions and stuff on the end. It was a really interesting uh, uh, presentation. So that's coming. Out, I think next Tuesday, right. uh, the second version of that 2.0. So uh, the fabulous Mark Norris will be back at the uh, at the helm. Uh, for that one. So somebody's looking gonna forward get, to that. Who's going to get yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> But I, that's all for me. So if there if there's no questions or anything else like that, no, uh, we're, we're all we're done there. Questions. So uh, yeah, I think we're excellent. done. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks for joining for us today, up. guys. Appreciate your time. And have a great day.